Thank you very much. We're really delighted to see those of you who are here, and we, we, and, and we know that there's a, uh, a rally for Mumia going on today as well. So we're really delighted that our people are here. Uh, this is an incredible uh, day. I uh, would like to uh, also uh, let you know that uh, we have a number of announcements to make before we start. One is the original Juneteenth of Camden uh, is going to be held uh, actually uh, on uh, June uh, 17th and 18th, on, Ju on Sunday, June 18th from 2 to 8 at the Fordham Park. And one of our uh, important people, uh, Brother Mangaliso Davis, uh, is uh, deeply involved in, in that project. And so we're looking forward to that project. And there are many other things that will be coming up. Um, in addition, uh, we would like to say that uh, we are aware of everything that's going on in the African world. And we certainly... Um, want to uh, uh, mention the situation in Sudan. Uh, my uh, maternal ancestry goes back to Sudan. So I'm extremely uh, upset with what's going on in Sudan. Uh, but uh, I'm looking also to the bright spot. So we have, of course, with us a wonderful, incredible uh, brother who is uh, uh, actually from Sudan, and we will uh, have him uh, on uh, next week to give us, during the time that I speak about Cleopatra, uh, we will have him to precede me to talk about the situation in Sudan because we don't know what's going to happen in, in that country given the incredible uh, battles that are going on, but the battles are not going on among uh, African people is going on among the Arabs. Both of those guys are Arab guys who control militia. And so uh, we, 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 we're going to analyze that and try to figure out what's going on and what the future is for a democratic Sudan. At this time, I'm going to ask a brother who is uh, here often, uh, Brother Ransom, if he would come up and for our audience, both uh, here in the, uh, here physically and those who are on uh, YouTube now uh, to hear him do his libation. Brother Ransom, please. Okay. Hotep. 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 Everyone who has died or made transition is an ancestor. We stand on the shoulders of those who have come before us. Therefore, I will do an ancestral prayer and at which time I will pour a libation. I give praise and thanksgiving to the omnipotent creator. I give praise and thanksgiving to the light and energy of the four directions. I give praise and thanksgiving to the light and energy of the air I breathe, the water which sustains life, the fire which cleanses the earth, and the earth which holds me up. I give praise to all the honored ancestors who are seated at the feet of the creator having completed their work on this earth. I give praise to my ancestors who have buried the soil of Africa and the Caribbean. I give praise to my ancestors who died in the Middle Passage. I give praise to my ancestors who were buried in the soil of North America, whom the Native Americans called Turtle Island. I give praise to my ancestors who were buried in the soil of Central America. I give praise to my ancestors who are buried in the soil of South America. I give praise to my ancestors whose blood runs through my veins, and yet their names are not known. I give praise to my ancestors who walk with me, who look for me, who guide and protect me. Spirits, I welcome you. I offer you water to purify you of the bondages of your life. Hotel. Hotel. Ashe. All right. Eddie. All right, thank you so much. Joe, give, let's give a pause. There. Thank you so much. We are fortunate today. Uh, we have uh, today at the Maleficati Asante Institute here in Philadelphia uh, one of the outstanding uh, uh, intellectuals of our time. Uh, I call him uh, a brilliant 
a psychiatrist because he is a medical doctor, but he is also uh, an activist. He's always been a cultural activist, one of the outstanding organizers of people in uh, New York uh, area. Uh, he is the co-founder of Simotap. And many of you know that, some of you know that I have spoken at Simotap many times. Uh, he is um, uh, not only uh, brilliant and uh, uh, incredibly insightful, uh, but he is a true brother of solidarity. And I have to say that uh, he's accompanied by a great woman, his wife, uh, Richardina, who is also and uh, uh, a doctor in her own right, uh, they are a power couple uh, in uh, the New York area. So I am uh, delighted and happy uh, for us here in Philadelphia uh, to uh, welcome uh, the incredible uh, Dr. James McIntosh. Uh, and uh, we're yeah, and please, uh, would you just uh, silence your phone? I'll be the first one to do so because <laughs> I know mine is one of those that <laughs> comes up on me. All right, uh, Santa Santa, this time, brother, we welcome you so much. Thank Come. Thank you. I asked the elders for permission to speak. I mean, I've often thought, what would it be like if you said that and they said no? <laughs> you know, so I just drove three, mi three, three hours from <laughs> New York, <laughs> you know, but I'm so glad that uh, they said yes. And then, and as, as, as it's happening, pretty soon I won't have to ask anybody. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm close to uh, Two days ago was my 75th birthday, so, so I'll make sure I get at least one hand clap. There you go. All right. <laughs> Now, I'm, if I don't have any other content or anything, at least I got that one hand clap, okay? So um, it's very humbling, you know, to have uh, one of your heroes, one of your main heroes, to speak of you in such glowing terms. Uh, it's also a burden, because I have to live up to it. If I come here and mess up now, you know what I mean? This would be bad, right? So, uh, but um, just to give you a sense of who Malefi is in our lives. Uh, we have a blended family, but, um, well, my oldest son, Tyeri, uh, that means ready, okay? And my second uh, child is my daughter, and uh, she, her name is Asantiwa, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, named after Ya Asantiwa, um, who led her people in the last of several wars against the British uh, you know, for, for, for independence, really, for freedom. And um, we have a son, Kwame. Y'all know who he's named after? Okay. All right. And then uh, I have one more son. My youngest son is our son together. And his name is Malefi. Okay. So he's Malefi. And he's named after two other great men, Malefi Henry Wesley. Wesley is, is uh, his grandfather, and Henrik is uh, John Henry Clark's, of course, uh, the name he changed his name to. I didn't know at the time because I hadn't read enough, you know, otherwise I would have probably named him Henry, you know. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so with that out of the way, uh, our topic today, I'm going to put my glasses on just so I can look. I, I don't really need to read or anything. Before I do anything else, I want to give you four or five definitions of power that people have given, uh, you know, from different places. Uh, some of them are, one. Of, I mean, all of them are superlative in one way or another. I'll start with the one who is the wickedest, okay? He, 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 I mean, he is, to me, the wickedest European ever existed. Now, you say, wow, he... Who are you going to talk about, Adolf Hitler? No, I'm talking about Andrew Jackson, okay? Andrew Jackson was wicked, wicked man, wicked man. I mean, he was so wicked, he told the Africans that if they would fight in the War of 1812, when they finished, they could be free. He took and put them right back into slavery. He was so wicked that he would put out wanted posters to say, 
that he if you bring him back uh if you if you bring him back you know you get a certain reward but for every hundred lashes or so that you gave him more he did the reward increase very sick sick person so people say well he didn't kill as many people as Hitler well I'm tell you if he had more he would have killed more okay because uh, he took the indigenous people here and of course made them move all the way out to the west um, and you know this famous picture of it, the trail of tears he took the elderly the infirm the children everything you know it was just horrible right so he said that money is power there's a longer quote but money is power is what he said Mao Zedong said power grows from the barrel of a gun Wade Noble said, power is the ability to define reality and have others respond to it as if it were their own. Mm -hmm. And Maulana Karinga said, power is the ability to reward your friends and punish your enemies. So I'm going to start out there. My topic is, of course, countering negative. Well, I've changed it to countering negative media, but it's really the same thing. The word information comes from the Latin word informare, which means like a formation of the mind. Especially in this digital age, when you look at it, that's really what information is, isn't it? I mean, information is kind of like one of the building blocks for the software of your brain. Your mind is the software of the brain, if you really think about it that way. I mean, it's just a metaphor. Now, don't get crazy with it, but it's just a metaphor. So when we're talking about the software for the brain and changing the pieces and the components of it, that really the information you have can change how you feel. It can change how you think. It can change how you perceive. It can change your actions ultimately. If I was to take a, syst a set of dots and put them on the on the on this this year I should have done it I should have done that and put them up here a set of dots that was like a straight line and a curved line like this you know like a hook line like this like that looked like a 13 if I took it and I showed you a 12 first and then I showed you a 14 after and put that in the middle you would say a 13 but if I put an A on this side and then put that in the middle and put a C on the other side, you would call it a B if you couldn't see it. You understand? Do people follow that? That your perception, the way you was changed by the information you had, the information you had A and C told you that this middle thing must be a B. And when it, but you make the dots close enough where it's ambiguous, right? But if the, you would interpret that ambigu ambiguity, you would, you would uh, assess it on the basis of the context, the context in which it occurred. So listen, my, my talk is not going to be all like that. You know, I mean, I'm just trying to lay some basic principles and concepts out uh, before we start. So we, we're clear that information can do those things. And at the same time, information has to come from somewhere. In general, it's going to come from one mind to another mind. That middle between one mind and another, I mean, it could come because the mind, this mind takes it and writes it in a book. Another mind takes it and paints it in a picture. Another mind takes it and makes a web page. Another mind makes a, a matchbook cover or a billboard or whatever. That middle part come the, when you check the root word, for, it's media, medium. Medium means the middle. So media is the middle from one mind to another mind. We all on the same page here? Anybody completely lost? Okay, if nobody's completely lost, I think it gets simpler after that. Oh no, there's one more complicating thing here. A man named Marshall McLuhan, when he was talking about how important media was, how central it is, he said, the medium is the message. You know that the most important part of that communication is how you present it to the person, how you transfer it to the person. And you could take it and, and talk about that for a long time. Uh, but I want to tell you what I want to tell you about harmful media. I have about four points I want to make. The first one is, is that 
It's why is harmful media harmful? Why is negative media harmful, number one? The second one is just an expansion on that, which is to say that harmful media can actually cause the difference between life and death. Okay, so that's my first two points, and I'll stop there for the time being. So I'm going to start with my own field, which is the field of medicine and psychiatry. So we've heard sticks and stones may break my bones, but we're so on, words will never hurt me. But is that really true? Let's start with some examples in medicine. This man here, Benjamin Rush, is known as the father of psychiatry. He is also called one of the founding fathers of the United States. He's a signer of the Declaration of Independence. And he said, and, and some of this information may be very familiar to most of you. You know, I know you're all a, a great scholars. Betty Dobson once warned me, that's the co-chair. So she warned me, she said, James, remember, every time you talk to an audience, there might be two or three people out there that know as much as you do about the subject. I don't think that's true today. I think there might be about 20 of y'all out there. I, know, I think there might be about 20 of y'all out there that know as much as me or this. But, but I'm going to still uh, go as though, you know, um, I have something to, to tell you. So you're probably, how many people out there already heard of Benjamin Rush? Okay. Well, Benjamin Rush is called the father of psychiatry. And his face appeared on the logo of the American Psychiatric Association until around probably 2011, something like that. Certainly when I trained and went through school, he was on the cover of the, of the, uh, of the uh, uh, DSM, the D Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. So he believed that we suffered from a disease. The reason you're black um, is not for any other reason, but it's from a disease. It's an actual disease. And I mean, he was so sick until he would actually get a person who had vitiligo which is, a, a, that's the disease. A person had his normal, natural black skin, but if he started getting vitiligo where he had spots and st stuff, in, you know, and it, he thought that this was like we're moving towards a cure, you know, for, for this blackness. That was, that was him. And, and he felt that we suffered from something called negroidism. You see it in some books, it says negritude, but when I looked at it, the books that I saw, he said negroidism. And that, you know, it was something that could be cured by, of course, making you not black. There was another guy by the name of Sam, uh, Samuel A. Cartwright, and all of you all have heard of him. He, he, he came up with a mental diagnosis. You know, Africans that were enslaved would try to run away. He said, no, 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 they, they're suffering from, they're suffering from a sickness. This sickness is called draptomania. And uh, what was his cure for it? His cure for it was to beat the hell out of them, right? And getting back to, to, to Rush, Rush thought that we had thick nerve endings. It's something like leprosy, he said. This disease, uh, negroidism, is something like leprosy. He said that it, it, um, it, that's the reason why, he said, Africans can take more pain than other people. This is what he said. Now, that's just words. Are they harmless? No. Picture on the left is a brother by the name of Peter. He's in... Uh, I believe in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, he, he found his way to a union, a mili you know, union military outpost, and this is the condition they found him. And I hope that picture's clear. Can you see this? The keloids and everything on his back. And he told the name of the people who had beat him and that sort of stuff. And uh, it's a really a horrific picture. But if that picture is horrific, the one on the right is more horrific. And I think probably most of you all recognize that. How many of you all recognize this picture right here? I see one person recognize it. This picture, and I'm going to stay away from controversial things, but I'll tell you that it hung on the wall of Pfizer Pharmaceutical Company. That name sound familiar to you? Yeah. Okay. Hung on there until 2007. They sold it at that point. I don't know why, or they, it was, certainly was transferred from there. My suspicion is, is that they sold it. Anybody have a guess as to why Pfizer might sell off art in 2007? Again, I'm not trying to play 50. Anybody have a guess? Like, yes, sir. Not lynching for a racist ideas. Meant that, um, well, it would be meant that um, this would make them have racist ideas. Okay, that's, that's one. I mean, that's a certainly would have been a, that's a good guess. It's not it, though. But yes, brother. Yeah, I think that's a picture of uh, the operating room of James Marion Sims. 
Exactly. And uh, he operated on black women. He was the father of gynecology. Exactly. Wow. So his, Invented the speculum. Right. Now he has a, a picture that Pfizer had, but there was a statue in, in the uh, park in New York. Bryant Park in New York, yes. New York, yeah. it's a, I think a medical school in France. Oh, okay. So the brother said, the brother was, brother knew all about him. He said that this is a picture on the right of the operating room of J. Marion Sims. J. Marion Sims was a, uh, the head of the, at a certain point, was the head of the American Medical Association. He was thought to be such a great man uh, because he pioneered in certain kinds of surgery. He found the way to surgically fix uh, rectovaginal fistula, something that can happen as a bad result of childbirth. And his statue was in uh, Bryant Park. Sometimes I have the slide to show you the glowing words they say about him. I mean, because it's really, that ties into one of those definitions about power's ability to define reality and have others respond to it as if it were their own. But if you were to respond to him from a different perspective, and I learned that about responding from a different perspective by a book, uh, a book called uh, Afrocentricity. I can't remember the author, but, <laughs> but, but, um, so if you were to respond to him from our perspective, he was a butcher. That's right. Is that right? Yes, he was a butcher. OK. So um, Harriet Washington points out in her book, Medical Apartheid, that this is an a idealized picture that cannot make you imagine the horror that's about to occur. He operated on black women that by American law he owned, mm -hmm. all right? And he didn't just operate one time, he did multiple surgeries on them. And all surgery was pretty much butchery in those days in, in that they didn't have effective anesthesia until just before he started doing this. So in 1845, if he'd had the, 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 the desire to, to, I mean, when they started using it in surgery, it wasn't when they discovered it, but ether, they started using it about 1845. And these surgeries were done between 1845 and 1849. So if he had wanted to, trust me, if it was the president of the United States wife or whatever it is, he would have got some ether for her. But so they had no anesthesia for these sisters. And you can imagine the people having to hold her down and tie her down as they operated on her private parts. And all of that stems from those negative words about Africans. That's right. We can take more pain, That's right? right? Uh, what happened to this brother? You know, what's the cure for, for the natural urge to be free and run away? Beat the hell out of him, okay? So that's just one example right there. I kept in with inside my field, and I'm gonna see if, okay, so he, I told you he was credited. They call him the father of, uh, but, in my field, there are many people. I don't even have a slide. Okay, so, oh, look, I had it. I didn't realize I had the statue. Mm -hmm. This is the DSM. This is one DSM before I trained. They number them, DSM-1, DSM-2, DSM-3, DSM-4, DSM-5. There are things now that people say are, you know, uh, that are, uh, people say now are normal, that people said that were in the DSM that I trained under, DSM-2. You know, in other words, it changes on the basis of science and on the basis of politics. Okay, and other, you know, other factors. So that was a statue in Bryant Park. Fortunately, just this year, last year or so, they made them move this statue out of Bryant uh, Park. Actually, it was, no, it, first, um, actually it was moved for another reason, but then there were protests and they had to move it out of Central Park. It was in Bryant Park. They moved it for another reason to Central Park. And in Central Park, within the last couple of years, they made them move it. So, um, but in my field, we also have a guy named McDowell who uh, came up with, I mean, it's like Joy DeGruy points out that like when you own a person and that person is considered property, you can do whatever you want to for as long as you want to. And there's really nobody to challenge it. So he got an idea of how to cure, uh, hold on, let me see, it was a type of pneumonia. Uh, of typhoid pneumonia. So his idea for doing that was to pour several gallons, five gallons of boiling water on their spinal column. And he did these things. 
There was nobody. To stop. There's others that decided they should bake us, that they should put us inside of, you know, extremely high degrees. They just did any kind of things they did. And that's why people say black people in America have made great contributions to the field of medicine. And the, the end of that quote is most of it against their, their will, most of it against their own will. This really represents a cultural deficit in, or appears to represent a cultural deficit in Europeans. I mean, there are other places where, like I think of the indigenous people, and everything, where pe everything has a spirit. Everything has a, you know, I mean, even if you have to kill an animal, you say some things over it because you recognize that it's a sentient being just like you, right? But they talk about Descartes. You know, I think, therefore I am. Mm -hmm. Having dogs nailed to the wall, mm -hmm. explaining how these dogs couldn't feel pain. Mm -hmm. The dogs were crying, right, right. crying nailed to the wall. Mm -hmm. So like I said, this is something, you know, uh, that, that, that seems to move the culture. To the right, you see a man named uh, Louis Latimer. And uh, can I get a time check? I don't want to go over 45 minutes. Is 45 minutes OK? Yes, sir. OK. Uh, could I just get a time check as to how long I've been going already? Okay, I, I just looked at about 18 minutes, so I'm, I'm going to keep on. So uh, this next one on the right, that's Louis Latimer. Everybody knows what Louis Latimer did, right? Okay, Louis Latimer is credited with inventing the carbon filament. Uh, I actually have a picture to the right. That's his patent for the electric lamp. Now, the point of this is that Louis Latimer invented the electric lamp, certainly made improvements on it. And, and he worked at, for, in New York City for the Edison Electric Light Company. All right. So Thomas Edison knew who he was. And there was another brother who, if he didn't know who he was, he certainly knew who this brother was. He knew who Granville Woods was. Mm -hmm. He knew who Granville Woods was because Granville Woods beat him in patent court. Uh, Granville Woods is a brother who pioneered in electromagnetism. They credit the subway. They say the third rail was invented by him for the subway. All of the rides out in Coney Island, they wouldn't be there if it weren't for Granville Woods. But because of white supremacy, when he would do his inventions, other people would try to steal them, mm -hmm. Edison being among them. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, sometimes Edison won in patent court, and sometimes, on at least one occasion, Granville Woods won. Nobody can tell that story like Dr. Jeffries, mm -hmm. who says that it was because Granville Woods made a, uh, a model of this uh, invention. And you know, during the trial, now look, it's very easy to beat Granville Woods in patent court. Why? We got a white judge, a white jury, a white court, a white legal system. So it's easy to win. That's not the story. In news, we say, in journalism, we say, the story is not when a dog bites a man. The story is when a man bites a dog. You see? So, you know, it's, it, it has nothing for a uh, European to, you know, to, to, to beat you in court. <laughs> you know, I would win in court. If uh, uh, Richard Dina was the judge, you know, and all of y'all were on the jury, I'd win probably most of the time, right? So Granville Woods, why do I say this? It's, the importance is, is that I think he knew Louis Latimer, right? Because Louis Latimer improved on his <laughs> invention, the car. Okay. He certainly knew who he was, and he knew, we know for certain he knew who Granville Woods was because they had to go to patent court together. Yet, he took Latimer's invention, this lamp, mm -hmm. and he put it in a film projector, and he made movies such as the the wooing, the wedding and the wooing of a coon. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, let's see if I can tell you some of the other names. Um, you know, my brain just probably tried to wipe out some of those uh, <laughs> the, the names of some of those things. But anyway, he made this series of racist movies. Uh, and these are some of them. You can see the brothers eating the food. Oh, this was one, uh, uh, the uh, nigger in a wood pile, okay? Mm -hmm. All of these, this is Thomas Edison. So this is wickedness because it reminds me 
of an essay that, well, it's a book, but there's an essay in it called Hypocrisy is a Way of Life. Mm -hmm. This is by Marimba Ani mm -hmm. in the book Urugu. Mm -hmm. You know that this man not only is inventing things, mm -hmm. he's inventing things you want to steal. Mm -hmm. And you didn't steal successfully. I never finished that story. So Granville Woods presented his patent, his, his uh, model to the judge. Mm -hmm. Now the judge was at that point was supposed to say, you win, but he didn't. You still got to give the white man a chance, right? So he says, uh, do you have one? <laughs> now, people say that Edison was a genius. Now, you don't have to be a genius. They say, do you have one? What do you think Edison said? Yeah. Uh, yeah, what happened? I left it at home. The dog ate my homework. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, I left it at home. So he went home, and he came back the next day with a model. When he tried to do it, it didn't work. So that's one that Granville Woods won. Now, just to go off a little bit more to digress, I can digress just a little bit. Granville Woods, eventually, they came up with a different strategy. You know, this, this Negro is too smart. We can't beat him in uh, 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 patent court. He sued another company for stealing one of his inventions. What do you think they did? They sued him for libel. Do you know that Granville Woods actually went to jail when he couldn't raise a certain, yeah, yeah. Our story, you got to read scraps here and there and so on and so forth to put it together. And it's more horrific than you think it was even though when you're starting out as a conscious person. So those are some of those um, pictures I showed you. Okay. Some, looks like I, oh, okay, I'm, I see this one on the right is the next slide. I was confused. I thought, <laughs> I, okay. So that projector now that we're tracing to Lewis Latimer and the theft, mm -hmm. okay, and the wicked words that we're inferior, so on and so forth, that led to um, the next slide, which is, sorry about that. Okay. All right. There you go. That's a book called The Klansman, C-L-A-N-S-M-A-N by Dixon. And to the right, can anybody guess what that frame is to the right? It says Griffith, 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 and then it says all around there. Anybody see that? There's an excerpt from Woodrow Wilson's History of the American People. It says, adventurers swarmed out of the North as much the enemies of the one nice as of the uh, one race as of the other to uh, cozen, beguile, and use the Negroes. In the villages, the Negroes were office holders, men who knew none of the uses of authority. Actually, that's not the frame I thought I had. I just let you got to read things. There's another frame in which he talks about the the, the uh, development of the glorious Ku Klux Klan. That's Woodrow Wilson, the president of the United States. Okay? They don't teach kids that in school. No, they tell them about the League of Nations and all that. Okay, so that book, Words, The Klansman, glorified the Klan. Woodrow Wilson's words glorified the, the Klan. And that's a frame from a movie which glorified the Klan and uh, debased us. Uh, let's see if I can make this. Uh, Actually, it's a live slide. Uh, it's a video, but I'm not going to waste my time with it if it doesn't uh, doesn't play. You probably re might recognize this scene. It's from the movie Birth of a Nation. Mm -hmm. The book yeah. Birth of a Nation was based on this book, The Klansman, mm -hmm. and it came out in 1915. In February of 1915, it was released. And that book and this, words, information, negative information, led to a resurgence in the Ku Klux Klan, which you all all know as a, a post or, or as a, 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 an organization that strung, s s sprung up during Reconstruction to signal the post-Reconstruction era, okay, to actually cause the post-Reconstruction era. So I've made my first point. I've even made the first two points, but I'm going to make the the second point even deeper. Okay, so in other words, these words are harmful. 
The next thing I said is that they can lead to life and death things. Certainly what was happening to our people with the lynchings uh, during the uh, Jim Crow era, so and so, all of that is, is, that's life and death. But if you can believe it, there are even greater horrors and atrocities caused by, okay, so here in 1919 is the Red Summer. These are some of the headlines that were in the papers. Um, I, I wouldn't do this, but you just, you, it's not good enough to just talk about the fact that there were lynchings. Mm -hmm. Let's read this a little bit. Yeah. There was this boy. Yeah. Washington was a mentally retarded 17-year-old boy on May 8th, 1916. Remember, this is right after Birth of a Nation. Mm -hmm. Lucy Fryer, a white woman, was murdered in Robinson, seven miles from Waco. Washington, a laborer on her farm, confessed to the murder they say. In a brief trial on May 15th, the prosecution had only to present a murder weapon and Washington's confusion. The jury, confession, the jury deliberated for four minutes and the guilty verdict was read to the shouts of get that nigger. The boy was beaten and dragged to the suspension bridge spanning the Brazos River. Thousands roared, burn him. Bonfire preparations were already underway in the public square. Washington was beaten with shovels and bricks. 15,000 men, women, and children packed the square. They climbed up poles and onto the tops of cars, hung from windows and sat on each other's shoulders. Children were lifted by their parents into the air. Washington was castrated and his ears were cut off. A tree supported the iron chain that lifted him above the fire of boxes and sticks. Wailing, the boy attempted to climb the skillet-hot chain. For this, the men cut off his fingers. The executioners repeatedly lowered the boy into the flames and hoisted him out again. With each repetition, a mighty shout was given. If you want to know what 15,000 people watching that kind of barbarity is, that's a picture for it. Again, this is triggered by harmful words. George Jackson advised his brother on the outside when his brother received threats. He said, if a person threatens you, he said his next word should come through bruised lips. All right. So I'm not saying that to you. I'm just trying to really validate my point that, you know, you have to look when people start saying bad stuff to you, you got to start looking out for bad stuff to happen. Now, again, another kind of anomaly. They, they still give awards to D.W. Griffith. They still use Benjamin Rush's name and logo on special things. They don't do it all the time, the APA, the American Psychic Association, but some of their stationery still has it on. He's not, he used to be on everything. He's still on certain special things. Uh, and D.W. Griffith so, still gets those awards. And, and same thing with, um, he's still called the father of uh, obsessions and gynecology, J. Marion Sims. Okay, so, ah, here's a book. In Savage Africa, Six Years Adventure in Congo Land. Um, this is horror that beyond, you know, really the concept. You know, you just can't conceive of it. But here's some pictures that will give you a sense of it. This guy on the left, on your left, is Leopold, and he was from Belgium. He was a king, and he was first looking for ivory. You know, he was looking for riches. They would go and they would, of course, kill elephants and try to make as much ivory as they could get. But then rubber was, uh, they found that rubber was there, and then that became the driving force. And I mean, literally, they destroyed families looking for rubber and demanding them to produce. And these are some of the people. There's one picture of a brother that they're forced, and you can look at the brother's face. He's forced to stand and hold a bunch of hands. The mutilation and destruction that they did was, was crazy. Now let's go to the next one I'm gonna show you. That, that brutality in the Congo has never stopped. That's right. There's a memory That's right. within people of certain kinds of things. Just like in Central America, if you go back and see some of when they talked about blood flowing like rivers, this is doing way back. The same thing happened when the Contras and the, and the, and the Sandinistas, you know, uh, that war occurred. So there's a memory, you know, violence just doesn't end with one person. It can, you know, uh, when you get traumatized, one of the aspects of trauma is that 
you may you will well, I mean it's really a defining characteristic it means you repeat it you may repeat it with recurrent intrusive distressing recollections of the trauma you may repeat it with nightmares of the trauma but some people you take a kid that's this and that is happening and when he gets into school he starts beating up the people some people repeat what they do I could go off into that a little bit more, but I'm not going to. I'm going to, I'm going to really resist the temptation. Okay. So now these, uh, this one here, we got to play this sound. If this sound, if I can't play this sound, can you, can you make that sound happen for me? Is it something playing now? Hmm? Is it something playing now? Can you play it? Uh, I, I don't know how to click it. Just uh, take the oops, it's not click it there. Where's the sound at? It's right there. Where's the cursor? Can you just take that and click there the sound? They use the press to emphasize that white hostages are being held by cannibals. Imagine that. Uh, or white, white priests, white missionaries, white nuns. They don't say nuns. White nuns. You know what the paper said right here in Detroit. White missionaries, not just a missionary. A white nun. As if there's a difference between a white nun and a black nun. Or a white priest and a black priest. Or is, or is, or is, or, or if, the life that's in a white skin is more valuable than a life within a black skin. This is what they're implying. That was Malcolm X, correct. And Malcolm X was breaking it down even then. And this, these articles I'm showing you is what the newspapers, this is, this is just a fra fragment. I mean, they had headlines with this stuff. But the first one on the left is before a very important event. And the second one on the right is after. And I'll show you the important event in a minute. Oops, that's not the right way. This is escape. Okay. They use the press to. I'm not trying to do that anymore. Okay. So there's that picture I told you of the brother forced to hold the hands of people whose hands had been chopped off. I don't know if the reason they. I know the reason that Columbus people did it. They did it when the people didn't produce enough gold. Right. So I would imagine right. that this was when you didn't produce enough rubber or get enough rubber. Yeah. All right. But on the right, uh, there's one of our martyrs. Uh, he was slain on January the 17th, 1961. And you see those articles appearing about white nuns raped and all that kind of stuff. That's the kind of thing they do to precipitate uh, the violence that they need to occur to achieve their uh, goals of regime change or whatever it is that they want. Okay. So on the left here, I have this guy uh, who's writing an article about Gaddafi kills. You know, they said all kinds of bad things about him. Uh, and, you know, especially as he started trying to develop satellite communications for Africa and talking about, you know, African unity and that sort of thing. And you see, they, you see what happened. And then look at the uh, uh, sneering headline. Gaddafi killed by Yankee fan because this guy has a, a hat on. And I mean, this is, is brutality that should have been uh, decried by everybody in the world, but instead they were pretty much celebrating it. Now I'm going to bring it closer to home. These are the top 12 things that kill black people in the United States, or at least that were killing them. Probably now we'd have to, but it's just, we, we could include it in here and that would be like COVID you know, has, has, has come in here. This is some years ago. Um, heart disease, cancer, AIDS, pneumonia, bronchitis, strokes, diabetes, homicide, infant mortality, accidents, cirrhosis, suicide. All of these things have a component mm -hmm. that has to do with your behavior. Right. You know, you, you know uh, it, it's not like 100% caused by people's behavior, but you could, you could get rid of... 90% of some of these things were changes in behavior. So if you take smoking, you can blame smoking for heart disease, cancer. It doesn't help AIDS. It certainly hurts pneumonia, bronchitis. It precipitates strokes, okay? Uh, it, it, no good. If you take alcohol, alcohol certainly is the prime thing happening with cirrhosis. Uh, it is a, a, a leading contributor to diabetes because it's useless calories that you're that you're uh, consuming. It also has something to do with accidents and suicides and murders. And certainly fetal alcohol syndrome doesn't help when we're talking about that's a particular type of, of congenital disease. So you can see that behavioral components play a role in all of these diseases. Check, everybody with that? Okay, 
And I mean, there, there are other things. So if, if you take uh, something like um, AIDS, one of the risk factors for that, remember back when it you know, was drug, uh, you know, intravenous, but of course, drug use got to be connected to exchanging needles and stuff, and also um, promiscuous uh, sex, all right, was, was one of the uh, risk factors. Uh, so all of these things have their accidents, alcohol, drugs play a big role in accidents. I'm just telling you these risk factors because the next thing that I want to show you. So I got took to put together eight things that really contribute to, to some of those things or all of those things that I just shown, showed you. Smoking, alcohol, promiscuity and prostitution, guns, disrespect. Mm -hmm. Almost all murders happen from disrespect, mm -hmm. okay? I mean, literally, they say, you don't respect this gun, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, Violence, violence, you know, a lot of, see, you have to tease these, these factors out separately. Violence is a contributor to homicide, okay? In fact, this is a little fact for you. If you have two men together and they're arguing, like kids can fight and it's very unlikely to lead to a death. But when grown men fight, it can lead to a death very easily. Now, one of the interesting things, if you have two men and they're arguing, if a female is, is, is present, it increases exponentially the, mo the likelihood that a, a murder can occur. You know, this is during homicide epidemic when they were studying what it had, you know. And I guess it's because you, you don't want to look a certain way. Remember that thing, to the woman, that sort of thing. So uh, I separated out driving under the influence. That's a separate, uh, that's a separate factor. I mean, you could drink or you could drug. But when you drive, when you drive while you're doing that, I mean, that's even more um, uh, related to things. And drugs and the drug trade are related, certainly. We know the homicides. And as, in addition to the things, the congenital disorders and that sort of stuff. So just to establish that, what happened is, oh, no. Go through. One day I was coming. I, don't get, I thought I had some more slides. It's OK. I know what's on them. I was le leaving my daughter's Asante was in uh, Connecticut, and she asked me to drive one of her friends home, and the friend had a little child. The child was in there, and a song came on. It was a very catchy song. It was a shoulder lean, shoulder lean, and the little girl was singing it with a cute little voice, you know what I'm trying to say, that they have at that little uh, age. And then all of a sudden, I started hearing the things she was singing about. And I said, what, 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 what's going on, you know? so. I went home and I took the lyrics and I put them out there. And I looked and I said, this thing is a, is a, it had all eight of these things. Not that it mentioned, it promoted. You know, it promoted them. I hope I have a copy of, no, I don't. I don't have the lyrics here. I'm sorry. Um, it promoted guns. It promoted, uh, you know, and then when I did this with some teenagers, they go, he don't say nothing about smoking tobacco. I said, what's this? What's, 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 what's drove? What, what's a blunt? Mm -hmm. They said, it's, it's marijuana. I said, how do you make it? You take a cigar and you put, <laughs> they wrap it in a cigar. So it had all eight right. of the factors. Wow. What I discovered, now, why do I tell you that? This what I discovered was, now at the time, you know, you got to have a control with an experiment. I did this experiment, but I got to have a control. So I took the country western song. I wish I could show you. I wish I had a slide to show you. The country songs at that time were the exact mirror image of these. They, they, there were eight songs that with no risk factors mentioned. One song I had to stretch to get a risk factor. The rap songs, eight of the 10, promoted one or more of the risk factors, one or more, and one song promoted all of them. And what I came to discover that this was any time I did it, I got the same results. I would take the Billboard top 10 rap songs, and I go and say, well, how do you get drink while you drive by accident? How does that happen by accident? And so then you look at the things. These things are killing our people. And these are coming from negative words. 
murders, uh, you know, and I mean, but rap isn't, the, I mean, I'm not trying to just single out rap. Mm -hmm. This entire culture, it's like, they, it's like, it's like, like there's a loose screw up here. Right, right. You know, if you eat a certain amount of food, you know that you might get fat, right? If you eat certain kinds of food, if you don't eat, you know, but if you, depend upon your diet, if your diet every day was you'd get up and you'd eat a bowl of sugar and a bunch of cookies, and that you know <laughs> what's going to happen. All right, so why is it that you can look on the TV and on every channel, the shows are about murder mm -hmm. and killing, and then some of them are just sick special csi special where they and then they show you little slides of the kind of brutality and torches and stuff that the people were doing what do you think is going to happen if you keep doing this and they keep going they show you arnold schwarzenegger and he'll take a thing and he'll he's just mowing people down or they'll show you uh stallone and this mowing people down and then i hear them talking he said we don't know why these mass murders keep keep you know it's like <laughs> there's a loose screw up there I mean, I practiced psychiatry for 40 years before retiring. I, there's a lot of stuff I forgot. There's a lot of classes I cut, too, you know, when I was in school. But, but that much I remember, you know. You know, you, you, you know so, so that was the point I wanted to make. Now, next, we want to talk about what do you do about these things? Okay, what do you do about them? How do you counter this negative media. How do African people counter this negative media? What's my time check? You're at one hour. I'm at one hour? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, I'm, I'm so sorry, everybody. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to... Okay, oh, wow. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> well, better to have and not need than to, than to need and not have. So let me just summarize what else I wanted to show you, okay? So I was going to tell you about our organization, the Committee to Eliminate Media Offensive to African People, CMOTAP, we formed in 1987. And the first thing that we, um, we used to do, we would meet and talk about this bad media, right? Then we, uh, uh, Sister Betty Dobson made a, uh, a, uh, a chart to show you the headlines. And we were noticing that the headlines in this paper, Newsday, they were all negative about black people, you know? And like, we counted the articles and the articles were all negative. And this was a time when Jesse, by this time, Jesse Jackson, I think, was making his second run. So there should have been, we were only covered in the areas of sports, crime, and entertainment, all right? Well, how could you do that in a year that you have a black presidential candidate? Okay, you know, this, this, is, this is something. So the first thing we did is we wrote letters and stuff to Newsday, and they sent a person in to talk to us. He was a minister, a black minister. He was a flat catcher. You know, that's what they do. White people don't want to meet with you about these things, but they do. They're curious about, you know, wow, this is odd. What's going on? So he came there, and when he came there, he saw a couple of hundred people sitting there waiting to talk to him. And, you know, we had said, told people which ones could talk and which people, you know, couldn't talk, you know, don't, you know, okay. And so, and then we debated with him or, you know, we voiced our complaint, you know, intelligently and gave him our data and stuff. And he stopped and he said, he said, they're not going to believe this. He said, when I get back, you know, they're not going to believe this. So then the editors uh, invited us in and we went there and one of the editors was uh, a, a brother um, Les Payne. Mm -hmm. So Les Payne was there, and as we started tap dancing on their head, and some of these things would just happen, they would occur to us. That's what struggle does. Mm -hmm. Struggle will, you know, you might be somewhere, and, you don't, and all of a sudden you take a rock and you throw it, mm -hmm. and you get a certain result, and you say, hey, let's throw rocks. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? And you find out that that is, so what happened, on that day, I took the paper, and I went through and cut out all the pictures in which black people were in. Mm -hmm. Again, they were in the areas of sports, crime, and entertainment. So we met with them, and whenever we'd go in the right direction, you know, we'd see, we'd see less pain, you know, kind of nod or smile or whatever it was. And that's where I learned that when you are black and you have, you know, 
gotten some of these keys to the kingdom, you have these degrees and this sort of stuff. You are 10 times smarter than these people you encounter. I mean, never have we encountered any of them that could stand up to the arguments or the information that we, they presented to us. I mean, they fold, they're nothing. They're so, they're so privileged, you know what I mean, that they just get things for nothing. The things you have to work for and kill yourself for, they get those things handed to them. So we tap dance on their head. And at a certain point, you know, when people are desperate, they reach out for something. And we started talking about the sports car. He said, well, are you saying that, that sports, sports are negative? By the I said, no, we're not saying that sports are negative. So these are the things we said. We said, this is what's wrong with you. You have, they're all from one perspective, the perspective of the white male, all your articles. Mm -hmm. Two, the amount of news that you have for black, you know, it's, 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 it's minimal. And three, the news that you have, it's all in these three areas. Sports, crime, and entertainment, the spectrum of the coverage. And then lastly, the polarity, negative or positive. It's all negative. So when he said that, I said, well, no, uh, we're not saying that all sports news is negative. But while you mention it, let's look at the sports paid articles for that day. And they had articles about Dow Strawberry when he was going through his problems, I guess, with alcohol and drugs. They had a lot of them, the, even the, even the narrow spectrum in which they covered us, it was always negative. So they made certain promises and so on and so forth. And then something happened. Uh, Ibrahim Hussein, a runner from, uh, I, think was from uh, he, I think it was from Ethiopia. But the New York Marathon, he ran in it. Now people are used to the brothers from the continent just winning every, every race. But at that time, you know, they had some st stellar European runners. And uh, as they were running, uh, the announcers were announcing, they, they focused on the second place guy when he would soon overtake Ibrahim Hussein. Well, they did something that hadn't been done in the history of, of televised sports. They, they were talking so much about the second place guy overtaking them that Ibrahim Hussein crossed the finish line without them filming it. So that was, and I said, I, I'm going to leave it on this. That, that was one of the things I learned is that like, our people will struggle, especially if they understand and the thing is clear cut. There's a lot of confusion, but if it's something clear cut, okay, 90% of them will get, become enraged about it. Not filming the brother coming across the, the, the finish line, right. well, this organization started in a church. I wasn't a member of that church, but I wasn't you know, in the church, but it, it was formed in the church. And they came out in their furs and their, 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 their suits and their spats. And you know, they were just dressed up. They came to the first demonstration, never been in a demonstration before. And that's when I realized the amount of infiltration in our, in our community because the cops were like, oh, who? they couldn't figure, who? they didn't know anybody. And they didn't know what, what is this, who is this, or whatever. And ultimately, you know, the people at ABC who were filmed it, they wanted to meet with us. And then we took the opportunity to complain about their treatment of a brother named Gil Noble. That's right. All right. Now, over the years, we engaged in multiple campaigns. And very quickly, I was just going to, you, you'll see the names of articles, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll just tell you. Some of the campaigns were for Leonard Jeffries when Leonard Jeffries came under attack. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of the campaigns were for uh, Gil Noble when he came under attack. Some of them were for the Black United Fund, which was a charity that came under attack. Hale House, when it came under attack. We basically, and these are the things we would do. We would demonstrate. We would write articles. We eventually had our own radio program, eventually had our own cable TV program. We used media to, 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 to do our propaganda. We, uh, as I said before, and then on a, a couple of occasions, even civil disobedience, okay? So, you know, I, I've been arrested four times. I never committed any crimes. At least I never got caught for any crimes. <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, Betty's been arrested, uh, John, John, you know, all of us, you know, we have been arrested at one time or another, but that wasn't our, our goal. Our goal was to achieve uh, uh, the victory that we were looking for at a particular, you know, the goal at a particular time, and it may lead to your arrest. It may lead to your vilification in the press. It may lead to all kinds of things, but that's what has to happen. Some people think that, well, if you just follow the rules and you just do stuff, there's a guy coming here named Hawass uh, yeah. from Egypt. Yeah. 
And he's getting ready to really promote this idea that the Egyptians aren't African. And I guess he thinks they're Arab. You know, he's an Arab, so maybe he thinks they were Arab. But some people want to go jump and tap dance on his head. Other people said, look, don't, 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 don't waste your time arguing with ignorance. Just tell our people what's correct. Both of those things have their truth in it. We've got to educate our people. We don't want unnecessary confrontation, unnecessary conflict. But if, 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 if you let the devil ride, then eventually he's going to want to drive. If you, you know, they've never been the type who say, OK, that's yours over there, and then this is ours over here. When they say that, they lie. OK, this is yours. This is your territory, uh, indigenous people, and we're going to take this right here. And then what happens? A couple of weeks later, they want some of that territory. They just break treaties over and over. That's what they do. You know, uh, Lobangula, we, we, we'll, we'll we're going to tell them to, to uh, we're going to tell them, they, they'll honor you, they'll be uh, under you, so on and so forth. And they don't keep to it. So. We're staying cool on this thing with Hawass coming because they're people, you know, they're brothers and sisters who have things going on in Egypt that they believe could be upset if we, you know, uh, and so I, I can understand it. So we're staying cool on that. But I predict that when he gets back, as they gain traction with this thing that uh, Egypt is not African, you know, they're going to start moving against the uh, scholars who uh -huh. present that. They're going to move against them. In a, I, this is what I think will happen. So the point is, is that there are many, many things you have to do. We've done we've social media, we've done, and I have slides, which basically, I won't even say anything about them. But I, I, I just, look, this is, this is serendipity, this is the ancestors, okay? The slide that my thing is on is of the ADL. I went and took a look, that's a, that's a group that defends the image of the, uh, of the uh, Jewish people. And it, they don't even, they don't even demand that the way they were formed, you, know, it's not, you don't even have to be right. You just have to be Jewish. You understand what I'm saying? And there's so many things that you would not consider anti-Semitic that they consider anti-Semitic. If you say that Jews are a powerful group of people, you know, you can come under attack for that. If like um, Kyrie, Kyrie um, um, Irvin, Irvin uh, when he said that, you know, that the Jews were the original Jews, or whatever, you know, that, that was enough for them to, to go. If you say that Israel is uh, committing atrocities, that's enough for them to call you anti-Semitic. But here's the difference in the way they, that, you know, remember those definitions? Power is money. Power is the ability to define reality, to, to respond, you know, it's to define reality and have others respond to it. All of those, they have developed the power to reward their friends and punish their enemies. And when I went to see it, if you go to, I went and got their IRS papers. Anybody can do it. There's a thing called Guide Star. You can go see any kind of nonprofit thing. I just want to give you the kind of money that they have. They have, the ADL has in gross receipts, $105,142,442. And then they got four organizations with similar names. They're able to pay, or everybody in CMOTAP is a volunteer. Everybody in CMOTAP is a volunteer. They're able to pay people. I saw where they were paying the head of the thing $400,000, but I'm not sure because I found them on another payroll of one of these other little groups here. Mm -hmm. So they have ways of like, you know, mm -hmm. you can give them a million dollars, but, you know, just spread it out. I can't say that that's what's happening, but it could be happening. And you can actually get the Form 990, their, 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 um, their uh, IRS Form 9090. And see, this is what we, you know, it, it, our people have to develop what we want our people to do is to develop uh, a certain level of s seriousness mm -hmm. to understand that you can't just let people decimate your image. There are things they're showing on TV. Now, I'm not going to go into them. But there are things they're showing on TV that every time you look, it's a black face they attach to it. The weirdest, most disgusting stuff always is black. The person who gets killed the most horribly in a movie, the one that gets uh, 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 impaled in the horror movies, the one that gets dismembered, always is the black, the black face. So uh, I, had, I, I, I had wanted to, and I think I have done enough to save uh, some, uh, believe me, I was, I'm loaded for bear here. 
I, I, I have <laughs> slides. I wanted to show you some of the articles, you know, all of the articles we publish. Sometimes we publish them under our own names. Sometimes we publish them under uh, pseudonyms. We had to do pseudonyms when literally the governor's office came and told them, no, no, it was the attorney general's office. You, this guy's articles can't be in the news section. You got to put them in the op opinion section. And of course, our black press went along with that. So then what I had to do was I write them under another name. I wrote them under Malefi A. A. Tayari. That's my three biological Malefi, Asantiwa, and Tayari. It wasn't after you, Bob. <laughs> in, indirectly, it was. <laughs> indirectly. So, uh, you know, uh, we have, <clears throat> you know, I could tell you of some of the successes that we had, but, you know, that's another time, you know, uh, or, and certainly, let me leave you a, um, an address. Just put Dr. Simotap, D R C E M O T A P, Dr. Simotap at gmail.com, and I'll be glad to, uh, you know, write you back if there's other questions and stuff you have about it. Okay. That stands for Committee to Eliminate Media Offensive to African People. Okay. Thank you all. Absolutely, absolutely. That's what I was hoping. All right. Wonderful, wonderful. Very, 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 very powerful. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Uh, do we have anybody? Yeah, we have a question online. We have a question online as well. Okay. Uh, yes, we'll go into the back first. Yes, let me bring this. With the atrocities that you have just showed us, what kind of, not that I can't call them a people that behave like that, we got to seem like give a, a name for this type of brutality to human beings from a non-human being to do things like that. Well, you know, unfortunately, this really represents concepts and culture and that sort of thing, and it's transferable. I hate to say that it's transferable, but many of the things where people are cutting off, Renamo, these organizations, the Lord's Army and this sort of stuff, that when their mind gets, you ever see like these, these zombie movies or whatever it is like that? When an African's mind gets taken over by some of these things, they're capable of committing these atrocities. The origin of it, I'm, I'm, I don't know what I should say, but I'm from the Khalid Muhammad school in which he said, anything is wrong with a black man, he said, it's the white man's fault. Mm -hmm. He said, how far do I go with that? If a black man slips on a banana peel, he said, it's the white man's mm -hmm. fault. So I mean, he had a way of saying things in a way that's funny, but that's really, it's really the truth. And the point was, which he said was, because we're not even supposed to be here. We're not even supposed to be here. So, so the fact that, that you know, when, when something, uh, uh, you, you can look for a European origin of it, but it's, it's like an infection that has spread so far that unfortunately there are many, many black uh, perpetrators of these things, especially in the Congo. These mass rapes, it's not like a bunch of white, women, white men going in and raping uh, all of these people. I mean, the figures on the rapes in the Congo it's, it's, it's astounding. You just won't believe it. I'm talking about the rapes of the men and the women. Yes. You won't believe it. Absolutely. Yes. Um, what about the actions that these people do? Doesn't it create trauma for them in terms of going forward when they're having wow. their children wow, that's participate a and look question. at all that horror? No, you are absolutely right that post-traumatic stress disorder affects, it can affect, you have people that committed all kinds of atrocities and then they can't sleep. Fanon is the one who really kind of, the first person I know who spoke about it. He, he, he was taking care of the torturers during the day and the tortured at night. He would go with the rebels at night to teach them how to resist torture, you know, how to handle it. And then he would have uh, these people who were doing this stuff, they would be troubled with nightmares and can't sleep and this, that, and the other. He was treating, you know, he was doing, so it can happen, you, to get, to be traumatized, you can experience a trauma, you can witness a trauma, 
you can perpetrate a trauma. I had soldiers from Vietnam that, you know, were my patients that had wiped out, you know, these, these types of things, and they were traumatized. You can even be just confronted with it and suffer from and, and, and have the uh, psychological uh, consequences of, of that. Of course, you know, we have much more empathy for people who are victimized by it and witness it and are confronted with it. But I mean, I had a patient one time that her father had been, uh, what they said, killed army style, meaning that he had been quartered. She had never met her father, but she was dreaming of meeting him. And she was planning on me. And when she heard how he died, she developed post. She, you can just be confronted with the trauma and be traumatized. So certainly it's affecting them. And maybe that's why they're repeating it so much, because one of the things I told you is repetition is, uh, OK, so does that answer you? OK, perfect. Hi, good evening. I'm happy to be here. Um, would you say that um, these people are motivated by an agenda? I would say it's warfare. Uh, from day one with these people, that they're motivated by um, resources. Um, that That is the one thing that, that is, I would say that is the primary thing that have driven them to come out of their area uh -huh. and to proceed, to proceed to inflict warfare upon melanated people around the world. Yeah, it's I, the, people, have, people have come up with different kinds of theories Okay, you know, there's the icebox theory that they were in a cold, uh, bar no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm just, go I'm being comprehend. I'm just going through them. I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm answering you, but I'm just going through some of them. Okay, I mean, like when you try to theorize, all we can do is theorize. We can't say exactly what it is, but certainly, uh, profit, an economic system that profit is the driving motive. Uh, a society in which objectification of people, you know, is a part of it. A society which is individualistic. You know, Sheikh Anta Diop will tell you the different factors from the, uh, the, the northern cradle of civilization and the southern cradle of civilization. But understand, these are not reality. They are models of reality. They are ways in which we can try to understand it. And I do think it has something to do with the caves, the coal, I think it has something to do with the rejection on the basis of they, that they're rejected by their original mother. That's Francis Cress Welsing. You know what I'm trying to say? That it has something to do with that. It has to do with the fear of genetic annihilation. That's Francis Welsing. There are many, many factors, but you don't have to understand it as much as you have to prevent it from affecting you and your people. That's what that's the main thing you have to do is fight against it and stop it. But it does help if, if you can come up with some sort of magic cure to make them not operate the way that they does. That's a beautiful. Thing. And there's lots of people that spend a lot of time doing that. There are a lot of uh, theological people that do it. You take Martin Luther King, you know, I mean, he, he, he was trying to really make a change in the people who were doing it, his feeling was like, look, you know, uh, unearned suffering, he said, is redemptive. He also said, he said what Professor Clark called one of the most vulgar statements he ever made, that he said was when the four girls were killed in Birmingham, he said, if any blood must be spilt, let it be ours. See? <laughs> yes. Yes. OK. Yes. From the atrocities that he's inflicting every day. Can we just, yeah, that's a good question. We, yeah, I, mm, we got two questions online, but let's just finish the one. I'm so oh, sorry. Yeah, there's, there's a magnificent book by Dr. Marlon King called Why We Can't Wait. Yeah. In which he, um, which is, which um, states his, um, his, his, um, how he, um, he created the, um, Black Revolution of 1963, beginning about 1963, and um, it states all, all the um, atrocities that were um, finally brought the um, African people around to um, to want to make change. Okay, that's a good good comment, brother. Brother, go ahead, Doctor. Yeah, uh, l last time we were here, uh, uh, the uh, brother talked about Afrofuturism, 
Uh, and so we asked the question, I'm, I'm going to ask you the same question. Uh, have you heard of uh, the New World Order and the Great Reset, and how does harmful media play into that? I would say I've heard of these things, but I'm no expert on those things. I couldn't, um, you know, I couldn't uh, answer intelligently, so I, w I won't even try. But I've certainly heard of them, you know, the things that are floating around. All right, we have some questions from the Internet. Canada Racing Joy asks, how prepared are uh, we today as African people to protect our ourselves if the European people would return to such barbarism? They don't have to return. They are engaged in such barbarism right now. Yeah. I mean, they're taking drones and murdering people uh, all around. I mean, they, they, they have philosophies such as uh, low-intensity warfare, permanent warfare, yeah. these types of things. They, they don't have to return. They, they, this, is, this is active. This is an active infection. Excellent. Uh, this other one question, our last one is from uh, Kiara W. It says, the scholarly education is here, but how do we bring these ideas mainstream without uh, watering them down or appearing in a Eurocentric uh, standard, being as though they control the, the, the media? How do you suggest we get around that? Said, how do we suggest you? I do believe that we have to produce our own media. We have to uh, utilize our own media. Because, I mean, I know people, like, if my stories appeared in the Times, they would be studying, you know, I think they're good enough to be in the Times, but they're not. They, they, the white man's ice water is colder for a lot of our people, but it's not their fault. You know what Khalid said? You know, even if he steps on a banana peel. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, Dr. We, wor we worked the brother today. I mean, we worked him hard and long. And we want to thank him so much for a very powerful presentation. I mean, we got so much information and so much knowledge. I think that we are just truly, truly blessed. And uh, this is a, yes, this is a remarkable uh, presentation. And I just want to re remind you uh, that uh, we are here next week. We're here on Sunday the 30th. We're here talking about Cleopatra, uh, Jada Pinkett Smith, and the Arab question. We're doing that on the 30th. That's next week. So we'll see you then. We will also be talking about Sudan. We will by then have some clarity about what's going on in Sudan. And Brother Tugu Sanusi will be with us and we will be exploring that issue as well. And I just want to say to my brother, uh, James McIntosh, Doc, you did it today for us. We appreciate you so much. I mean, and, and Sister Richard Dana, we are so happy you came. We are blessed. We are honored. Uh, we, we, we started back after uh, COVID, and we, are, we, we have a, a, a wonderful group of people who come here, and to come out and hear you is a wonderful thing. And thank you so much. Thank you, Brother Kareem, uh, our technical uh, uh, institution, and, and brother, brother Carlton, who just, who just had me to talk to Brother Leonard Jeffries yesterday. We hooked that up yesterday. So we call upon our ancestors far and near, the mother of our mothers, the father of our fathers, to render mercy and to bear witness for the liberation and victory of all oppressed people. It is done. Ashe. Thank you all very much. Thank you all very much.